Um, all right. So we'll go into panel introductions. And when I, when I introduce these guys, and hopefully you guys remember, is um, just introduce yourself and say something interesting over the last year, something that, you, that caught your eye that you thought was a cool or potentially emerging trend. Um, and then we'll go into the discussion after uh, we've done all the introductions. And then after the discussion, hopefully we'll have time for you guys to, uh, to ask us some questions. So that's, that's the whole agenda in depth. All right, so now here I am, and I'm going to stand up um, to try to sound intelligent. So one you know, interesting thing for me this last year was related to a blog post that I put out there called Death of the Mouse, and, and notice it's in question form. Um, I was questioning the status quo, essentially, of input devices out there after having gone to CES and noticing uh, I didn't see a lot of mice out there, except for a couple of things that were, were run kind of under uh, you know, kiosks and stuff like that. You just you know weren't seeing the mice as much, uh, the mouse as much anymore. So <clears throat> this got a lot of views. I mean, for a corporate blog, I mean, my stuff doesn't get much traction, to be honest with you. So I, I, fifteen uh, thousand views and, and forty plus comments in a couple of weeks was actually pretty good. Um, Miriam probably gets that on your status updates, but for me, I thought it was cool. Um, it was then picked up by uh, Max and PC, and they changed the context of this. It was no longer a question. It was Intel manager says the mouse is dead. Um, so <laughs> it got some fun reaction. Um, things like, Bob Duffy's an idiot. Uh, people like Bob Duffy put out these crazy statements. Next week he will say the gas engine will be gone. I've eaten alphabet soup and cropped out better material than this. My favorite, Bob's brain is as small as the atom processor. Awesome. That's, that's, that's a keeper. That <laughs> was good. Um, it, okay. They didn't say it's powerful, just as small. <laughs> small, yes, yes, uh, and so on. But here's the thing that struck me about this: as as we've all been kind of interested and excited and talking about new input devices out there, you know, tablets and stuff like that. Just the simple questioning of whether the mouse uh, had seen its best days um, created a lot of visceral reaction for people. Lots of mouse lovers out there. Um, they love that device, and the mouse has had a lot of staying power. So it, as much as we've been seeing new trends, you know, it, the question that comes into my mind is, is there going to be something else that will have that staying power as a mouse? Is touch interface as we're seeing it today, is that just one kind of more of a, a, of a bubble that's been created, uh, it, it, and it's transient, and we'll see something else over time? Um, so it just got me really thinking. It, in terms of trends, we've, we've called these things different stuff before. We've called them fads, and remember them called game changers. And if we don't like the trend, we call it a bubble. Uh, in the 90s, we called all trends paradigm shifts, and now we call them disruptive technologies or disruptors. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of cool things happen that are building upon each other, you know, just something like in the 50s, a hula hoop, which allowed for mobile autonomous play. I could take this toy anywhere with me, throw it in the station wagon and, and have a game by myself at grandma's house. Um, transistor radio, real-time um, mobile content distribution. It was cool. Yeah, I could be mowing my lawn and you know, I could hear the Beatles um, played from the radio. And then in the 70s, we had um, our first video consoles and software distribution at retailers. I remember going to Sears and buying software. How cool is it that I could buy uh, software at Sears? And then personal computers hit in the 80s. And then what I think is the latest um, and, the, and the biggest trend that we've seen lately, which is a digital store paired with a mobile consumer device. And I think that, is, that has been the game changer, at least in my mind. The store paired with the device. Uh, that's essentially been the iPod model, the I iPhone model, and uh, the iPad model, and that's what we're also seeing with Android and the Android marketplace. And the Kindle model. And the Kindle model. Yes. So, then we had some almosts. I was a big Laserdisc fan. You know, I still have Terminator 2 on Laserdisc, and I, I like to play that, that thing up every once in a while. The, the sound is awesome off of it. But those things, I mean, huge, big uh, album cover based things. So, Virtual Boy, anybody remember this? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> we actually just reviewed it on Engadget a few months ago as a retro review. Check it out. Good deal. 
That thing was crazy, caused a lot of headaches, from what I understand. But Sony House has a new one out there now, which is more for viewing movies in 3D, but apparently you get that theater experience by putting on uh, Sony's new device. Newton, um, probably before its time, a little quirky, a bit buggy, um, but the first uh, PDA, really. Um, and I put IPAC in this category because at the time, uh, I was pretty excited about it. And I remember hearing a lot of folks really excited about the iPad until the, the iPhone came out, and then you stopped hearing about it. So it was essentially Windows shrunken down into a mobile device, and it really wasn't designed well for that form factor. So we have some things that kind of almost happened, didn't happen, but we had some other things that have stuck. And I, I think there are some pieces to the puzzle on what will be the next thing. Lots of cool stuff happening out there. We have a new breed of developers. I mean, if you look at who's trending well in app stores, it, it's not generally the, the typical software developers that you heard of yesteryear. They're, they're a new breed of independent developers. We now have these app stores out there. I think uh, in one of the keynotes, it said like 120 different app stores out there. Faster mobile uh, access, which gives you ubiquitous access to apps in the cloud uh, for faster services to data. And then we do have the cloud, which now allows us to take stuff either um, with us, um, store data remotely um, and discreetly. Um, and then we have a, a whole set of uh, new devices. We've talked about the compute, compute continuum quite a bit. And then a, a new set of technologies, uh, things like OLED or you know, like Connect device or uh, uh, electronic ink and uh, augmented reality. So, any of these things on their own is really not the next thing. I think it's kind of like what we saw with the iPod. It's a pairing of things or a combination of these things might deliver that next great experience uh, in trend that you as developers should key into. So that was me trying to sound smart. Hopefully it sounded somewhat intelligent. Because I don't do what these guys do for a living. So I just get to sit back and make friends as a community manager. So my attempt. Um, okay, so the thing is, we're going to talk about these trends, look into them. Uh, you know, these guys are going to give us uh, their opinions on it. Um, so, here are our wonderful panelists, and we'll start with Chris, and we'll just go on down. Um, you guys introduce yourself, but when you introduce yourself, say who you are, what you do, and name something that this last year you thought was pretty cool. Okay, uh, I'm Chris Skaggs from Soma Games, and uh, we make... Uh, our, our IP across a lot of different platforms, so, but basically from that mobile thing. So primarily it's games, but then we also do a lot of work for hire for, for other folks. So one of the big like wha-bam moments for me was when I walked into a, a restaurant down the road here on I-5 at Great Wolf Lodge, and they had taken Fruit Ninja and putting it on a touch screen, or a, a, a motion screen about as big as your car dashboard, and I had this all of a sudden like epiphany about they had taken this little mobile game and now blown it into a cabinet game. And it, really, it just made me think about this whole space about how content is delivered and shuffling up. And that's really exciting. Cool. Ajay. I'm Ajay Mungura. I'm the product manager for App Up and the App Up client services. So I get to kind of look at what is next for App Up kind of thing. So one of the disruptive things that I saw last year was I spent a lot of time with the embedded guys with the uh, guys from TV manufacturers and car manufacturers and the connected car, connected TV experience. And it's very interesting in terms of like what does it take to be successful in the services in those industries. And I liked uh, Google TV actually last year and the trend because I was amazed. Like I thought like, it, like the remote that the Sony had really was bad interface and it was not going to work, but it turns out that like you know, everybody that I tested it with, they love it. And the kind of things that you can do on a TV now, you cannot imagine. Like I don't need a computer to be connected to a TV anymore. I can do what I can on a TV. So I like that. Uh, my name is Matthew David. I work for a technology startup uh, based out of uh, Belfast, Ireland, called Jampot. And um, I guess one of the things that I've seen as a, a big change in the last year is that uh, Businesses and developers are not looking at building apps with just one platform anymore. They're looking at apps and seeing how they can deliver them to a whole slew of platforms. And then you have the added on challenge, which is being able to deliver apps to a whole slew of different screens. So you've got you know, your TVs, but you have tablets, you have uh, PC, you have computers with you know the Mac App Store and now the Windows 8 App Store. And it's like, how can you take your content and optimize it so it works effectively for that platform, 
but you don't have to keep rebuilding and learning multiple different technologies because they can get expensive really fast. Yes, hi. So I'm Miriam Schwar. Um, I am a, an ex-developer, engineer, hardware, software geek turned journalist. Um, I'm a senior mobile editor at Engadget, and so that means I get to play with every phone in the world all the time, which is fun. Um, also means I get to travel, which is also fun. But um, what I've noticed in the last uh, year or so that really made a big difference for me, and that's what I was going to say, was uh, LTE, the, the really high-speed technology for, for wireless. But I thought that was kind of a dry answer. So then I kind of elaborated in my head a little bit, and I think there's more to it here. I think uh, the dual core phones we're seeing are really making a big difference, and, and I think what, for me anyway, and so what I've, I'm, it come, it's come to occur to me that I think there's a kind of a pendulum swinging in, in the mobile world, and it's the pendulum of the software gets really, really, really good, UI, UX, um, we come up with all these great ideas, and all of a sudden, the hardware doesn't really, can't really cut, cut it, right? Like there's not enough wireless bandwidth, or the CPUs are too slow, or whatever. And then and the pendulum swings the other way. Now, I think we're at the point where the pendulum is kind of going in the hardware section. So like we're seeing all these incredible advances on the hardware driven by all these needs we have for the software and the cloud and everything. And then I think eventually the pendulum will swing back and we're gonna see all these new advances in the software because the hardware now allows it and, and et cetera. And so, so to me, it's, it's kind of like, last year if you asked me, I would have said a four inch screen on a phone is all I need and I want better software. And this year, my motto is, um, I'm super hyped about the hardware changes I've seen in the last nine months of all. And I didn't expect that. I mean, I, I expected, in the back of my head, I knew the hardware was gonna evolve and get better, we all know that. But all of a sudden, I'm like, this is really impacting me in a significant way. And I think it's gonna drive software like in the next year or two, like significantly. Hi, my name is uh, Noah Kravitz. I'm also a journalist, I'm editor-at-large with a website called technobuffalo.com. And uh, for the five years prior to this year, um, I was with a different website that covered only mobile phones. So I used to have Miriam's job where I, my job was to play with every new phone that came out. Um, and my current role, I get to do uh, some other stuff beyond just mobile as well. And so I'm actually glad that we went in this order and that Miriam spoke before I did, because instead of sounding like an idiot saying hardware is irrelevant, I can actually speak to what Miriam said and say that five years of playing with every new mobile phone and, and then tablet that came out really sort of burned me out on the minor iterations of the hardware itself just became entirely irrelevant to me. If I had to see another new Android phone on my desk, I was going to shoot myself. Um, and, you know, hearing what Miriam said is actually, that makes a lot of sense um, with the software advancing, what people are expecting from connected services, you know, everything else advancing, and then the hardware has to advance, keep up with it, back and forth. Which um, you know sort of brings me to I think the most interesting uh, thing that I've seen this year uh, just came out yesterday and is the uh, the Amazon Kindle Fire um, because as a symbol of what I find interesting and I think is important trend wise it sort of encapsulates um, everything it encapsulates the fact that the hardware is commoditized to the point now where you know a bookseller can have a $200 dual core tablet. Um, it also encapsulates the fact that content is king, which is something that 10 years ago when I worked at a dot com that burned through I don't know how much money and did nothing, you know, people kept saying like, no, dude, content is king, you guys are doing it wrong, yeah, whatever, well, it was. Um, and it also sort of for me encapsulates this idea that uh, I was reading some coverage of Facebook's uh, F8 conference and their announcements the other day um, and talking about this idea that there are these companies who are sort of trying to create their own internets and you know like AOL was years ago Facebook if you want to view it this way is kind of this walled garden of well you don't need the internet you just need Facebook and it's really interesting to me that Amazon uh, I think potentially in in more ways than Samsung or HTC or uh, Asus or whoever may have tapped into you 
know, the magic key to unlock the power of Android, which is forget Android. Just use it, fork it to build your own custom thing, have your own app store, have your own content and services, your own particular reasons for your customers to be interested. And there you go. And then, you know, you don't need Android. Like, you've got what you need from it. So that, to me, is... Uh, We'll see if the thing actually works well, but that to me is, is the most interesting thing I've seen this year. I actually that brings up a thought. Maybe you guys can comment on this. Is and I, I have a feeling personally, like that the vertically integrated solutions that uh, you know I don't I hate to say Apple pioneered because they did, but that they, they really got right um, are starting to proliferate in a certain way. And I think I knew that Amazon would. would nail this, and I think they're going to be extremely successful over the holidays with the Kindle products. And they're going to show the rest of the world that this, this, this kind of tight vertical integration really matters, and I'm mixed, I have mixed feelings about that. You know, I'm a big advocate of open source, unlocked phones, the wireless providers being dumb pipes, etc. You know, I, I rant about it on the podcast, and Gadget Mobile podcast, all the time, but the reality is the average user just wants to pick up something that just works. And they want an experience that works for them. And those of us who are nerds and geeks get it. We can jump from phone to phone, device to device, uh, ecosystem to ecosystem. But the reality is that I think we need more competition in these vertical silos because they're, they're, they're good. It's healthy to have the competition. Only having Apple is a bad thing. And, and to speak to what you were saying about, you know, uh, the, these uh, these ecosystems. I think the Google ecosystem is another one. I mean, you know, they're not tightly integrated right now vertically, but they're headed that way, right? Um, this whole agreement with Rise on network neutrality. Then you have like the acquisition of Motorola. I mean, I keep joking around all the time about the next thing is they're going to buy Sprint, and it's going to be a done deal. They're going to be vertically integrated, right? They just need some content now, and that's the only thing they don't have. They'll, they'll they have Motorola. They'll buy Sprint, and yet they'll still find a way to be unable to sell a product to a consumer. <laughs> because they don't have because they don't have a product. Yeah. Right? And so that's the that's the they're, thing that I'm saying. They're engineers, they're not marketers. Right. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way towards engineers, I just mean that's not what they do. So so I think the vertical integration uh, is a very much real. But I see that it's also a pendulum thing because uh, you're going to see that businesses are going to be really successful with vertical integration. And then they, they won't be able to achieve the economics of the scale, and they won't be able to innovate. And they'll have dependencies on every single layer on the platform. That if you, as you said, right, you can't catch up to your hardware innovation on your software stack. And that happened in PCs, that happened in mainframes, that happened in every industry that you can think of. And, well, even like TVs and cars are vertically integrated at this point. But you will start seeing that they will adopt more standards over time. But whether it is going to be two years, five years, is a big question. Because then you will start seeing more standards, more things, and more innovations on that. And then, they, then when everything falls apart, then again you're saying that the consumer is not getting what they want, and then there will be a vertical integration of a better solution. So we have to wait and watch. We are very early right now to say that the vertical integration trend will be there for the next five years. Because you don't have a good alternative, and you don't have good standards at this point. Yeah, I think that's right. I'd say that it's really interesting to look at that as we start seeing more and more verticals out there. Essentially, that the iPhone approved that you know that model is working and that model is successful. Um, and, and I think we've all been there with with Apple on this. Is that you know it's great to a point um, because as soon as I want that thing on something else that's not Apple, that's where it becomes a problem. And so. You guys talked uh, in your session yesterday about how many devices that you guys have, right? And I think the disclaimer was, we're all journalists, we're all bloggers, and, and it's our job to have this many devices. And I almost wanted to comment on that as I think, actually, I think what you guys are seeing is, is, is just the mobile professional. I don't, I don't think it's a, uh, a blogger or journalist thing. It, it could be the real estate person, or it, it could be uh, an a digital artist is I'm seeing people carrying more and more devices with them. I've got to be able to photograph this. I need to have something that's quick and easy to be able to turn on in order to consume and see what's going on in the world. And then I need to be productive as well. I need to be able to uh, stitch my uh, video together just like you guys are stitching your blogs together. So I think what we're going to see as well is more people are going to have more devices. 
And then when you start looking at the silos, does that mean that you know, your TV needs to be Amazon now too? Right? And does that mean that your in-car entertainment needs to be Amazon as well? And so I think it works to an extent, especially in a mobile device, but um, I, I fear what that means as we need more devices to do more things. Well, I, I think the silos right now for me, I mean, if I picture them in my head, they, they have specialties, right? I mean, the Amazon silo is, is the, the book, the publishing silo. I kind of think of it as the place I go to get my books and the place I go to get my music, actually. I get my music mostly from Amazon. I think uh, for a lot of people, I, you know, Apple, the Apple's ecosystem is, is the, their video and, and music ecosystem. There's some overlap there, obviously. But I think for me, the Google ecosystem, even though they don't really have something to sell me, um, uh, they don't have content, is, is, my, is my way of being organized online ecosystem. Right. I mean, that's where my calendar lives, my email lives, uh, my documents live, a lot of stuff lives. And, and I think that that's probably why you're seeing people carrying multiple devices, because they, they find the Kindle's e display the way to read books, and they find that the iPhone is the best music player, and they find that the, the Android phone is their best connection to the Google services, for example. But I think that this is, I think, uh, where there's a bit of a, of a gray area, and, and, and I think a lot of people fall on either side of this gray area, and a lot of people either fall on they do everything in one silo because they're not necessarily tech savvy and they want a simple solution, or they do like us, where I strategize about the content that I that I acquire so that it will work on my devices. Like I, I will never download from iTunes Store music uh, unless it's last resort because I don't want it to be AAC encoded, even though now it's no longer DRM, because I will convert it to MP3 because I know that it'll play in my car on my Android phone and on a Kindle and. And so I, I pick, I tend to strategize and pick the, the open standards. Well, they're not, MP3 is not open, but you know what I'm saying? The, the, right. the, the yeah. what's perceived to be the most popular and the most accessible on all the devices they use. Is that, that's actually interesting because I do the exact opposite. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm probably one of the, I think I've gotten less geeky over time, and I actually mean that in, in a slightly self deprecating way that. Um, I, I've just come to choose not just content, but also like if I'm looking to buy a new, and this is in my personal life, in, in my professional reviewing stuff life, I, I try to be you know, as objective as possible. But if I'm looking to pick up, let's say, a, a set-top box to stream video to my bedroom TV, it has to fit in with everything else I'm already using. And at this point, it's just, like, I started with one device and I liked the way it worked, and that happened to be uh, an Apple PowerBook Duo 230, you know, 20 years ago. And now I have, you know, I use Macs because I like the way they work for video editing and music production, and I use an iPhone because the camcorder is really good, and everything else has just sort of grown out of that. And so now it's at a point where you know, it's like, does it, it's a combination of things. It's, does this box support Netflix? No? Okay, forget it, because I already use Netflix. But then it's also, does it fit in with, you know, my Apple computer and my iPhone and my wife's iPhone and the Apple TV box I already have and the Sonos system that, you know, powers music around the house. And so the idea of, um, and the idea of carrying multiple devices to me is like, I don't know, maybe I'm still... I believe too much in convergence, or maybe I'm just lazy, but I actually, I would rather just say, you know what, like I'm not gonna be able to get this done today because I'm not bringing that device with me. Um, I feel like you're speaking to something though that, that, that and we're all speaking about this, is that what's happening with the, the hardware, the technology, and the software as well, is really about what we're expecting our lives to look like. It, there's like, there's a more fundamental shift is that for a long time, because technology was expensive, it was a place we landed and we tend to stay for a while. But one of the things that's happened, I think especially in mobile, but in, in desktops as well, is that these devices are becoming disposable by their nature. We expect them to be disposable, so you're only landing there for now. You know, And you're talking, Miriam, about an MP3, because that's a technology that you're staying with. It's sticking, right? But so many of these other things are transient by their nature. And I think, you know, to say, like, what's interesting in 2011, I mean, one of the trends I see is that touch, um, things like connect, th these kind of technologies, but they're, they're increasingly putting us in a place where we're closer and closer to the thing we want to do. The technology is de-abstracting this stuff. 
So, so we, we go from like you know assembly language to a GUI to you know to touch, and it's it's going to go somewhere else. And whether that's you know motions or freaking brainwave readers, I don't know what it's going to be. But all those things they, they bring us closer and closer to what we want to do. The technology gets out of the way instead of it being a barrier to what we're just trying to accomplish. And that's to have fun or to consume a video or chat yeah. with friends or whatever and, else. And to what you said about being disposable, it is really interesting. I've gotten over the past you know probably three to six months. Um, both readers of the site and friends and family, like a year ago, two years ago, the number one question was, I'm on Verizon, I really want an iPhone, what should I get instead? This year it's been, hey, which Android phones can run Netflix and Skype? Yeah. And you know, and it won't be Netflix and Skype next year, it'll be Spotify or it'll yeah. be Xbox Live or you know, whatever. The number one question I always get is, where can I play Angry Birds? Right. I mean, it's just right. all the time, right. can I play Angry Birds on it? Right. And you know, people are, are driven by what the the apps are, and then they they throw away the technology, but they, they come in and they get pulled into a channel. And you know, it could be the Apple channel, it could be the Android the Android channel, you know, Amazon's channel. But then they get pulled in, and they become lifelong members. It's kind of like being branded into something. Like you know, I drink Coca Cola, my wife drinks Pepsi, but I will you know I will never get her to drink Coca Cola. And you know, we become lifelong brand addicts. It would, would. One of the things with that, that I just want to add that sort of the Angry Birds. Angry Birds is one of those situations where it's it's like the way the iPod was. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know when when did iPod come out? Or two thousand something like that? Ten years ago? Yeah. So um, I, I had like four. I mean, we had so many in our different families. I, I was rebuying the same thing over and over again. And Angry Birds is the same thing for me. I don't know how many times I've bought Angry Birds now for every device out there, and then when I go to one device to the next device, I'm on a different level. I already completed uh, this stuff here, but now I've got this other device with me, and I, I'm stuck back there again. So to me, it reminds me of what's happened and involved in, in the iPod technology. Eventually, we just got you know to iTunes Store, and we can now move that, that music to whatever we want to move it to. And I think that that's what needs to happen to Angry Birds. I want to buy it once, and I want to be at the level that I want to be at, and then any device should be able to access that level. And I, so I think that some of these things are still shifting. Yeah, I think that's very, very good because at the end of the day, the way I see it in the future is your phone will become your personal identifying device. It carries your global settings, it carries your preferences, it carries your stuff. You take your phone, sit in your car, that means it's your Facebook account, it's your Twitter account. My wife goes into the car, it, is, it becomes an identifying device and you carry it with you wherever you go and you carry that experience with you regardless of the platform. If I'm going to like a, my favorite vending machine, for example, it, like, you know, I know that I need Pepsi or I need Coke and it would send an SMS and I would, SMS payment will get filled and I would get my Coke, right? Or if my wife takes the phone to the vending machine, it will give her like, Pepsi, whatever is her preference. So it becomes your personal identifying device and a low computing device or a high computing device, depending on what you would compare it with. So it's going to carry that to your TV, to your um, dining room, bedroom, to your printer, to everything that you want to do. I think that's where we will see that connected experience, even though there's going to be vertical silos. People would want that. Angry Birds, the new crisis. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? Does it play crisis? Um, but uh, to, to, talk, to kind of go back to your point, I think it's interesting. You know, I, I know some families they mind that are like the divided families. Like my spouse is a hardcore, I, you know, iPhone user, and and I've tried to convert him. Like I'm like, hey, try this Android phone. I think you'll actually like this one. This one's this one's my own favorite. It's really good. He's like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Take it away. <laughs> well, and, lucky you for marrying uh, marrying above your grade. So. I know. <laughs> but you know what's interesting is that is that, that on the other hand, he, he really loves the Galaxy Tab Seven inch. I'm like. It's a freaking phone with a seven inch screen and without a 3G radio. Like, how can you not like an Android phone? So it's very interesting to me that there are, I mean, it's like I know a family where, you know, they're both photographers, one is an icon person, the other one is a Canon person, and they're constantly infighting about, you know, I think that's how they resolve their intramarital conflicts, yeah, but, yeah, it's but like it. fighting about cameras. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it just shows you the power of this silo, and it's, it's kind of the danger that I try to stay out of myself by, by trying to adhere to these standards, you know. Um, speaking of developers, I think uh, it just occurred to me, I want an Android app that 
allows me to basically hit a button and it automatically configures my phone with all the settings and apps I want. It downloads them, it does install them, it knows my settings, and because all the phones don't have the same UIs and the same setting screens, those settings it can't resolve. It'll give me a choice to resolve, like basically kind of like you know when you check out code and you need to merge it with someone else and it gives you a diff and you're like, ah, oh, well this is the version I want, this is the version I want. This is what I want. So I, just, I get a box, a phone in a box from uh, PR people, and I just connect to a server, and it just configures everything. My passwords, everything. Done. And um, you know, Apple kind of does that with the iPhone. Um, it, 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 it works, but somehow in the Android universe, like HTC has their own thing. It works between HTC devices, but there's no universal Android. And I know there are some conflicts there, but I, the conflicts give me a choice to resolve. You, you write up like that, I'll pick you up on Engadget. Well, so that yeah, you know, this this gets to something I was thinking about that you said about you know whether you're moving from phone to phone or home to car to your friend's house or whatever you want to have, or you've got Angry Birds on a new phone, you you want you don't want to uh, you don't want to have to level up and unlock all the badges again. You want to be right where you were. You want to be listening to the same song. You want to have your Facebook timeline already updated, whatever. But so how does that happen? I, I'm not a developer, but I've talked to enough developers to know that you know you don't have, especially in this wonderful golden age of any developer can now set up their own shop and sell around the world as long as you're willing to give up 30%. You know, um, you don't have the time and the money and the person power to develop for every platform out there. You know, that's why Microsoft is paying people to port to Windows Phone 7 because otherwise they just they're not going to do it. So, is something like HTML5 the answer? And is it actually web apps ultimately will better serve people because they're not platform native? And if, I don't know if it's HTML5, but if there's a framework out there that lets you access hardware level resources that you need to do really cool stuff, you know. I'm, I'm gonna jump in here because uh, this, this is an area that in the last three years I've really been looking at. I know I've got to get a light, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so um, I've, I've written, I'm just writing my third book on HTML5, um, but I've also written a number of books on native application development, and I've spent a lot of time with the uh, HTML5 wrapper tools. And um, the reason why we got together to start up our company is that we were trying to address this, this exact problem, which is you, know, you create an app, and you really have to have that app on so many different platforms. But how do you control the data? Well, the reality is, is that the client has to be a native app for each platform because you need to take advantage of things like you know Android phones have the back button, has the menu button. On the iPhone, you have a different way that people are used to seeing your menuing. Um, if you have a Windows Phone 7 device, you have the Metro interface, which is a cool interface, but it's a tile-based interface that's completely different to the other platforms. And then if you have WebOS, well, we've done. <laughs> so, you know, we looked at this, and what we've done is we've actually put all of our data into the cloud because we want to separate and, you know, keep the data and the actual content away from the actual client so that when you pick up the device, you can actually then just pick up and go from where you are from right there and then. But then as somebody that's actually creating an application, you can actually update it and push it out to the cloud and have that kind of ex um, same experience on all the different devices. It's, it's, but it's a real challenge, and, you know, and we're certainly going through our R&D trying to get it to work. And you're not, you're not necessarily incentivized by the people controlling the app stores to do yeah. that, right? I mean, Apple, yeah. Google, they prefer yeah. that you build a native Absolutely. app for you. Yeah, they, they, all, they all want their native app because they want the slice of that high. App up may be different, but, you know. Yeah. You know, as I'm a sure consumer, <laughs> I'm curious to know, like, like Bob and I, I think you guys have also uh, echoed the same concept. If you downloaded Angry Birds once, right. um, and you got to whatever, the level eight or something, mm -hmm. and then you also, when you want to download it on your next device, or your next device, or your next device, you don't want to pay for it a second time, right? Yeah. Right. Second, third, fourth time. I understand that. But would you be willing to pay more for the first time then? Well, it always comes down to how you monetize, and the the thing that no, no, I know, I'm from the yeah. consumer level. Though. Yeah, even from a consumer level, there's a completely different way that you want to be monetizing on mobile devices. You know, certainly the easy way is saying, you know, let me charge for your app. But we all know that charging for an app is a barrier to entry. You, know, you charge for your app. I mean, I had apps out last year. I would charge 99 cents, and I'd get one or two downloads a day. I make the app free. Suddenly, I was getting thousands of downloads of the app. It's the, the same. Atari app. cartridges cost 45 bucks. Mm -hmm. 
Didn't Atari cartridges used to cost like yeah. forty yeah, dollars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and like yeah. you had to pay money to buy a record. And yeah, stuff like I know, that. I know. Well, but I, but the thing is, with um, mobile applications, one of the things you can do is you can have advertising. But the areas, if you look at the companies that are making a lot of money from mobile applications, they're giving the app away, but then then they're supplementing content into the app. And the way it's been doing, you know, the common ways in-app purchases. Go and look at the iTunes App Store and look at the uh, companies that are the top grossing companies. All their apps are free. They're making content because people are buying virtual goods. I, I agree. It, yeah. I, think, I think the thing is, you have to understand, and I hate this in a way, because we live in a culture of free. And that culture was in, in part created by the last five years of technology. You know, Google making everything free and having the money to somehow make it free. Um, but ultimately, people want stuff that's free, and then when they see a really cool added value to it, they will pay for it. I'll give you an example. I'm a Flickr premium user, and I used Flickr for free for like a week, and then I realized, oh my god, this is so awesome. I'm going to pay the $19.99 a month, a year or whatever it is. It's, and it's also a reasonable price, right? You have to look at the price point here. $19, $20 a year. Uh, divide by 12 is like I spend more on coffee every day, right? So the bottom line is is this is I think the, the key and I know it's hard because you know It's you really need numbers for this to happen But I think that this is the key and and I'm torn because I'm the first person who would love for people to stop going into wireless stores getting the free phone and then committing themselves to to hell for two years um, which is the model they're going. Like, I keep describing this to people. I say, imagine you went to the car dealer and you wanted that Ford pickup truck. But that Ford pickup truck would only work with Ford gas on Ford roads. But you can get it for $3,000, just your down payment. That's it. Would you do it? And they go, you crazy? And I'm like, well, you're doing that with your freaking phone every time you walk into a wireless store. You know? And, and it's, it's, I think, there are just some things where people don't, you know, they don't get it. It's like another thing, tethering on phones. You pay extra in the US for it, it's ridiculous. Right. Imagine you bought a router at Best Buy, you plug it into your ISP port, and every time you plug the uh, device in the back in the four ethernet jacks, they would charge you more because you're sharing that connection. Isn't, isn't that how two-wire works, though? I don't, don't know. those two-wire routers? No. The bottom line is it's, it's like people, when you start giving them analogies of the things that they're doing with wireless that they're not doing in real life with other things, then they start, I think, getting it. And, and I think, so I'm on one end, I'm torn, because I, I want people to like pay up front for things and be free and have choices and use an unlocked phone on whatever network. But the reality is that's not the way it, things are headed, especially in the US where, you know, you, even now, like you can't even have choices of wireless carriers because the phones don't work on it because frequencies are different and it's just like doesn't matter anymore. So I don't know. I mean, if you're gonna go that route, then make everything free and then value add it with some some. Yeah, I, I think that's it. To, to answer Chris's question, um, yeah, I think Angry Birds should be uh, buy it once and I'd probably pay a premium a little bit more for for the app. I think that you know the apps have gotten a little too cheap. Uh, and then uh, allow me to download it on any device that I want for any platform that I want. But then I'd pay extra to be able to have that data in the cloud so that I could be able to sync my device up with a cloud server so that the next time I play Angry Birds is I've got that same exact experience. That I'd pay more for. So that value-added service to be able to get my data to sync with me is, is critical. Yeah, and I'm familiar with I mean, all the monetization stuff you're talking about. What I was really asking about is a sense of, I think that there's a certain conflict between the way that the business models that go back, you know, 500 years about how you deal with things like cost of goods sold and all that kind of stuff, they're really up against the expectations of the customers right now. And there's a, there's a big muddy pile right now of what customers really want. They want a lot of value-add stuff, but by and large, a culture of free is, 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 is locked in. And so there's this weird conflict that I, that I think is, is right now resolving itself. People are finding other ways to monetize, um, but there's this weird mix about old ways that may or may not work. Um, I think advertising is a great example. There, I, uh, I, I think there's this notion, for example, if you if you do a Google search on does advertising still work, what you'll hear is yes, it still works because people are still paying for it. But it's this whole circular argument going on, um, and yet and yet there's this that is like a holdover from such an old model that may or may not still be valid. I'm not speaking to that, but it is a place where the whole nature of our business model is changing. So um, we're, we're getting close to where we need to do Q&A here, but I want to ask you guys um, one last question is, we actually never got to the questions because I figured this, this conversation was exactly what we wanted to do. <laughs> they were all uh, essentially answered in, in our discussion here. Um, but the, the last question is, um, 
in terms of helping our, our developer audience know, and even helping Intel as well, is because you know we're we're on the hardware side of things. Um, what should we be thinking about? What are some of the key trends um, that a developer needs to be aware of as they start developing applications for next year and beyond? So, I, Miriam, you said one thing. You you know you you wanted something, some synchronization, sort of, so stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're back at it. Like, I I think this is where our Kindle, like Amazon, has the thing. You know, the Amazon cloud, cloud, right? They, they have they have a platform based around the fact that you can store data on the cloud, and and an entire ecosystem around that. So it's easy for them to uh, you know make your, your, your make it possible for your Angry Bird session to get saved. You know, it's just I'm I'm a little weary of the fact that all the apps out there try to implement, well, a lot of them try to implement their own version of syncing their own version of storing the data in the cloud. I'm sorry, but just, you know, like, there are lots of really good solutions that exist out there. I'll give you an example. I was, um, this is, I'm wearing a t-shirt now for, from Dolby Labs when I worked there. It's IdeaQuest, it's a yearly thing, like they do like Yahoo, where they get all of us in a room for a week, and we can crazy, come, come up with crazy ideas, right? And, and implement them and show them off. And, and I won a prize on that one. And the, the reason I'm bringing it up is because like a lot of the stuff that came out of that was for me that I, I wanted to write a mobile app, but I didn't write a back, write a backend database and a backend server. I didn't have time, so I used Dropbox as my database and cloud. They had an API. I'm like, great, it's easy to use. I'm just going to make that my database, and I just created some random text files in a folder in Dropbox, and just parsed them, and that was my database. And the point I'm making is that you know there's already tons of solutions out for syncing stuff, and we just kind of need to find some commonality there. Uh, and, and maybe that's something that Intel and, and uh, AppUp can do, is provide some kind of cloud synchronization, cloud storage that all the developers can use. So you have an identity, you have an account, and you know that um, it's transparent. Like if you get an app through uh, AppUp uh, automatically, it is it sees that user space of yours and can store stuff there. And yeah. It's secure and it's authenticated and it's properly done and maybe it interfaces with existing services so you can advertise the fact that you just put up your awesome level of Angry Birds on your app up share or something. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I'd just like to you know, agree with that because we have to spend a lot of time you know, going through cycles actually developing this stuff and it's like, well, we shouldn't be, we're not the masters at this. There are other people that have much larger economies of scale that it'd be great for us to just tap in so that we can do what we're really good at and build these really cool apps. And then you can just get those apps and then you, you can be up and running whether you're on Windows Phone 7 today or you're running on a Metro tablet tomorrow. And that reminds me of when, like, when OpenFain first came out on iOS. There was this whole thing about leaderboards. Everyone wanted a leaderboard. Yeah. And, and this idea that I didn't have to roll my own for that was, was such a huge time saver. Yeah. And, uh, and frankly, I still really love what, what OpenFain's doing. And that same idea of cloud storage and stuff, it's great. Yeah, I just met with them last week. They're doing some really clever stuff. And you know, just being able to take those ideas and say, look, they've already got this great API. Let's take that. And uh, there's actually um, a great place I went to last week called Mashery. You probably know the Mashery. <laughs> you know, and you know, if you're a developer, go out there and don't try and recreate the wheel. There are people out there who have done some incredibly cool stuff already, and you can just tap into their APIs, and you know, they want you to use them. It makes your product more valuable using them. So you know, I mean, yeah, yeah that's, that's now they're cross-platform iOS and Android, and why aren't they on an app? Up? I mean, let's make this happen. So, uh, <laughs> Scott Crabtree, where are you? Um, so one, one key trend that I see, Bob, just to say that is, um, how many small businesses can you start today without having a website? Hardly. <laughs> so it's, you need a website. And like I think the trend that I see is now that everything that you do in your physical world requires an app. And it's not going to be the set of developers, all the geeky people who could like, you know, geek out and write like really complex code to make things happen. Maybe still that will be in some games and stuff. But for most apps, it will, I think I'll see a lot of trend with tools and services that will evolve to a point where it becomes extremely easy, like creating a blog post is like creating a website. You will start seeing that with creating apps as well. Well, so, um, do you want my three word answer? It'll be three words, I promise. Three words. Know your customer. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, so to wrap up here, what I'm hearing here, if I can try to get a, a kind of common thread on here, I'm starting to hear that we need services, we need APIs that allow this, 
silos that are being created out there to 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 work with each other. Bridges between. Those we need those bridges, right? And we need we need developers and we need companies like Intel to, to help uh, move those common standards forward. Okay, any questions in the audience? So, right for those services. For those services, is it a cost of doing business for the developers or for the users or for the app stores? Like, who pays for the cloud? It's free. <laughs> <laughs> the internet is free, isn't it? <laughs> it's just, it's not always just great. <laughs> I, I, the VCs pay for it. Like, I was just saying, drop. I was just thinking, Dropbox is compelling because the use. It's the user's account. It, it's not Amazon Web Service. I think it's a combination of models. I mean, Amazon obviously has their own services as well, as long as they play nice with everybody. Um, yeah. That's like a multiverse question, isn't there? Yeah, Multiple clouds. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we, we ran into that same issue because we started on one cloud service and then yeah. went, went to another one because it was cheaper. And uh, what we've done is we've actually created a middle layer, which is it's just you know you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. But yeah. you know, you're having a cloud that goes into a cloud, right. and you know it's. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm actually convinced there's 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 a startup waiting to actually create that. It's like you want to switch and go from Azure to right. you know Amazon's uh, cloud services. Click here and you're good to go. But, but that may be something that happens as a trend. You just need to virtualize the cloud, that's all. There you go. <laughs> Get out of Any other questions? Um, I want to remind you please fill out the cards there in front of you. I, I think if you can't find a pen, there's probably pens outside the door when you, when you put them in there. So I uh, want to thank our panelists here. Uh, you, <laughs> you guys proved me right, very smart group. Um, so, uh, and again, um, uh, thanks everybody for joining this session. Good talk.